Good evening and welcome to October 13, 2015, Durham City County Planning Commission. Welcome to the Planning Commission. The members of the Durham Planning Commission have been appointed by the City Council and the County Board of Commissioners as an advisory board to the elected officials. You should know that the elected officials will have the final say on any issue before us tonight. If you wish to speak on an agenda item tonight, please go to the table to my left and sign up to speak. For those who wish to speak, please state your name and your address clearly when you come to the podium and please speak clearly into the microphone. Each side, those speaking in favor of an item and those speaking in opposition to an item will have 10 minutes to present for each side. The time will be divided among all persons wishing to speak. If you're here opposing a rezoning tonight, you should be aware of what is called a protest petition. A protest petition can be very helpful to those residents who live in the rezoning area. Please consult the planning department staff for any details on a protest petition, and they will be happy to help you. You should also keep in constant contact with the planning commission as to when your case will go before the elected officials for a final vote. Finally, all motions are in the affirmative, so if a motion fails or ties, the recommendation is for denial. Thank you. Could we have the roll, please? Mr. Busby? Present. Ms. Freeman? Present. Mr. Gosh? Present. Mr. Gibbs? Yes. Mr. Hollingsworth? Mr. Harris? Present. Ms. Huff? Yes. Ms. Hyman? Present. Mr. Keechan? Mr. Miller? Present. Mr. Riley? Present. Mr. Van? Present. Mr. Whitley? Ms. Winders? Present. Mr. Hollinsworth has an excused absence. You received the minutes. What disposition do we, would you like to take on the minutes? Mr. Chair, I would like to make one correction and then I'm uh, ready to approve the minutes. Under my written comments for the Family Fair Highway uh, case A140012, it should say I vote not to approve. It says I vote to approve. Okay. And otherwise, I would move approval of the minutes with that one correction. Okay, the clerk, did you, did you get that? Okay. All right. It's been motion that we approve the minutes with the correction that was stated. Uh, do I have a second? second? Second by Commissioner Winders. All those in favor of, hmm, of approving the minutes with the one correction, please show the right hand. Okay. Uh, do we have adjustments to the agenda? Good evening, Mr. Chair, members of the commission. Pat Young with the Planning Department. Uh, I do have two requested adjustments. Um, the first would be to add item 6B under new business, which is a discussion of the Coalition for Affordable Housing and Transit um, re requested ordinance revisions uh, presented by Dr. Winders. And 6C would be uh, adoption of the 2016 uh, meeting schedule for the Planning Commission. Thank you. And I also have a, uh, an adjustment. I'd like to make a recommendation immediately uh, uh, after we approve the, uh, the agenda. Uh, it's a recognition. So to have a motion to adopt the agenda as motion, as a, Motion to adopt the agenda as amended. All those in favor, let it be known by showing the right hand. Uh, did Grace Smith get back in here? She's on her way. She went to get a copy of the UDO for Commissioner Freeman. Uh, okay. Then I will wait until she's back in here to do the recognition. Uh, the first 
Item item five is a public hearing for Farrington Mix Z zoning change Z15 quadruple nine. <laughs> I will open the public hearing for that case. Good evening, Amy Wolf with the planning department presenting case Z150009, Farrington Mixed Use. Uh, the applicant is Wood Partners and it's in the city's jurisdiction. The request is from the present designation of office institutional with a development plan and residential suburban 20 to mixed use with a development plan. The site is 19.95 acres and the proposed use is for a mix of office and residential. The site is four parcels of land at 5708 Farrington Road. It's between Rutgers Place to the north and um, has uh, Crescent Drive to the west. Uh, so between Rutgers Place to the north and uh, NC 54 Highway to the south. It's in the suburban tier in the Lee Village suburban transit area. It is encumbered by two overlays, the FJB watershed protection overlay and the major transportation corridor overlay. The proposed uh, request and development plan meets the standards for the mixed use district as described on this table as well as in the staff report. It's 19.95 acres. The proposed maximum density is 30.08 dwelling units per acre, limiting the height to 120 feet uh, and, and meets the open space and uh, maximum street yards reflected on the development plan. The site is described here on the left of this slide is to, is to the north, so it is tilted just a bit. Um, there is presently a single family structure shown on the development plan to the north of the site along Rutgers and a, an existing place of worship along Farrington Road and Cleora Drive. The, most of the rest of the site is covered with tree or tree covered. And the proposed use reflects the requirements of the ordinance. Uh, it, Tree coverage is not a requirement of the compact tier. The site commits to compact tier. Uh, it shows the uh, committed access points, one on Farrington Road, two on Crescent Drive, two on Cleora Drive, and there's three cross access um, points described. The, it meets the minimum commitments of, the, of a development plan by describing the intensity with a range of 500 to 600 residential units, 100 to 173,000 square feet of office, and 100 to 500 square feet um, encumbered in a parking structure. There's five access points to the public right of way and three cross access drives to the to the south, the existing development to the south. The uh, the graphic commitments uh, are the location of the access points and the loca location of the building and parking envelopes, which follows the property line. There's a number of text commitments associated with this request. Uh, this site will have one vertically integrated building in the first phase. There's commitment for transit improvement as well as um, asphalt for a bicycle lane along Farrington Road. Uh, the, and the project will comp be completed in three phases. There's commitments for landscape des guidelines, which is a requirement of the mixed use district. There's um, improvements to public street standards on Rutgers Place and Crescent Drive as well as Cleora Drive uh, with a, uh, improvements for sidewalks and bicycle, uh, sidewalk and bicycle improvements also on Rutgers Place and Crescent Drive. There's a number of associated tra traffic impact analysis improvements uh, and they're organized by site, um, by uh, roads. So at NC 54 Highway and Farrington Road, there's a number of improvements which include a left turn lane on Farringdon Road, a left turn lane on NC 54 Highway, eastbound right turn lane on NC 54 and Farrington Road, and westbound right turn lane on NC 54 at Farrington Road. At Farringdon Road, um, they construct a concrete island to City of Durham standards and NCDOT standards along Farringdon Road in 54, um, dedication of four feet of addition, provision of 50, four feet of additional asphalt for a bicycle lane, as well as transit improvements as, dis, uh, as described by City of Durham, Triangle Transit, or Go Triangle, and data. 
also at Farringdon Road and Rutgers Place, there's a north, northbound left turn lane at Farringdon Road and Crescent Drive, uh, uh, improvement to city of uh, NCDOT and city of Durham street standards, as well as at Farringdon Road and Cleora, northbound left turn lane. So there's a number of improvements associated with the, the study for the traffic impact analysis. Additionally, there's improvements at Cleora Drive also with the TIA and Farringdon Road and um, and the site driveway and at the cross access driveway. This request for mixed use is consistent with the future land use map of our comprehensive plan, which is designates this site as office. Office is a pr uh, proposed use for the mixed use district for, and reflect on the development plan. The applicable policies of our comprehensive plan are, are met through this request and staff determines this request is consistent with the comprehensive plan and other applicable policies and ordinances and staffs available for your questions. Thank you, Amy. I have three people sign up to speak in favor of this project. I have Ken Spalding, Debbie, Deb Anderson, and John Ebby. And between the three of you, you have 10 minutes so you can determine how you want to divvy up the time. Okay. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, members of the Planning Commission. My name is Ken Spaulding. I represent the applicant in this matter. Uh, Deb Anderson will give the major part of the presentation. I just want to say that we have addressed the concerns of traffic, environmental concerns, as well as neighborhood concerns. And I just wanted to point out to you that it's, it's extremely important that we recognize how the private sector is stepping into an area in which we can show our not only support, but also the need for this uh, high transit corridor. We came by, uh, over in Raleigh, we, we ran into a situation where they wanted to take the funding away for light rail in Durham. The Durham County, the Durham City, Orange County, they recognized the need. And I think with this project, it shows where the private sector is not, all, is, is not only indicating its support for this, but also that they're willing to invest in this area and follow what the local bodies, governmental bodies have uh, indicated they wanted. So I just want to say that uh, this is a good example of both public-private recognition of what's important for the future growth of our community. Deb? Thank you. Thank you, Ken. Um, dear commissioners, thank you for allowing us to present our proposed mixed-use development on Farrington Road to you this evening. I'm Deb Anderson, director with Wood Partners. I'm here with our Triangle Office Development team, Ron Pereira, Tom Burkert, and Caitlin Shelby, and we're joined by Bob Zumwalt with McAdams and Earl Llewellyn of Kimley Horn. Wood Partners is a national multifamily development firm with a local presence. Um, I've been a Durham resident since about second grade, um, and I believe deeply in our city and the need for quality rental housing. Our Triangle office has been active in Durham for over 20 years, successfully rezoning eight communities in Durham, in each instance working diligently and cooperatively with neighborhood groups and local advocates well in advance of public hearings to design communities that meet the needs of all. Our communities have diversified Durham's rental housing stock to include Class A garden apartments on Ellis Road, Old Chapel Hill Road, Barbie Chapel Road, Davis Drive, and Garrett Road. We developed Durham's first transit-oriented, high-density multifamily community called Station 9 in 2006 near 9th Street. We've also developed a student housing community, which now serves NCCU, and an independent living senior community with an assisted living component on Fayetteville Road. Tonight we are pleased to present our first mixed-use community in Durham, located on 20 acres in the northwest quadrant of Farrington Road and Highway 54. Our project proposes both office development and multifamily units. Located within the suburban transit support area, we have voluntarily chosen to design our project to the city's approved compact neighborhood tier standards. The, sta the same standards that will likely set the tone for the future Lee Village transit-oriented design district. 
With your support, we hope to be the spark that ignites full city support for transit-oriented development in Southwest Durham. Given the recent close call with light rail transit funding at the state level, we wanted to show our commitment as a private developer to the city's goal for public-oriented, high-density, mixed-use communities near future light rail transit stops. Just one quarter mile from the proposed Lee Village transit stop, our project will be a catalyst for future high-density, mixed-use development in Southwest Durham. Additionally, we will be contributing significantly to the City of Durham and the local neighborhood by providing meaningful improvements to Farrington Road, Highway 54 intersection, and to Farrington Road, north of the intersection, as well as to Cleora Road and to the dirt roads of Crescent and Rutgers. The final improved thoroughfares at two and three lanes widths will feature bike lanes and pedestrian accommodations per the city's approved collector street plan. We estimate our roadway work at the intersection and along these thoroughfares will bring roughly $2 million worth of improvements to this important transit area. Our project also supports the comprehensive plan, section 2.1.1, which calls for the compact neighborhood tier to have an improved street level experience and to discourage auto-oriented and low intensity uses. And we will be encouraging the compact neighborhood tier's goal of creating appropriately scaled streets that slow traffic, reduce the crash rate, <coughs> leave more room for sidewalks and bicycles, while also enhancing the comfort of pedestrians. For neighbors adjacent to our site, new curb and gutter with storm drain will correct current drainage issues on the single lane dirt roads of Rutgers and Crescent. And last but not least, upon full build out, this mixed use community will contribute roughly 1.6 million in annual taxes to the city of Durham. We are joined tonight by Mr. Eady, a neighbor living adjacent to our site, who supports our proposal. I would like to thank Mr. Eady and um, other neighbors for working with our firm over the past nine months to improve our designs and pave the way for a successful development. In closing, we ask for your support of our mixed-use proposal. We remain committed to the city's goals for Southwest Durham and hope to be a catalyst for meaningful growth and vibrancy in the Lee Village transit-oriented mixed-use design district. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, commissioners. My name is John Eady. I live at 5708 Crescent Drive, directly across the street from the proposed Wood Partners development. I'm here this evening in a dual role. My first role is as president of our neighborhood association, the Woodland Acres Homeowners Association. Uh, which is comprised of the resident homeowners that live within the area of this property. My neighborhood association has been supportive of both the plans for the Lee Village Transit Station and for the concept of compact neighborhoods. The proposed Wood Partners development is consistent with our vision of this area becoming a transit-oriented, mixed-use, walkable community. Therefore, my neighborhood association does not oppose the rezoning of this property to mixed use. My second role is as an individual homeowner who will be directly affected by this project. My wife and I have worked with uh, Ms. Anderson in, on minimizing some of the impacts that this project may have on our personal living environment. Ms. Anderson has been very receptive to our suggestions and has uh, shown a willingness to make modifications that could help us uh, protect our privacy and our quality of life as long as those modifications meet current Durham development standards. Based upon Ms. Anderson's responsiveness to our concerns, my wife and I support the rezoning of this property to mixed use. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have <clears throat> other members in the audience that would like to speak to this item? Are there other members in the audience that would like to speak to this item? If not, I'll close the public hearing and bring it back before the commissioners. Do I have commissioners that would like to speak? Uh, hold on, let's see. Did you have 
Freeman, Mr. Gibbs, you know, Spiff, <laughs> Mr. Miller, where are you? Uh, and it was in by them. Okay. Did you You look away every time she raises her hand. Okay, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't see you. And uh, <clears throat> I also, uh, Commissioner Kitchen has joined us. Okay, uh, Commissioner Gibbs. <clears throat> Couldn't find the button. Uh, I have a question for, I guess for staff, if, if there's anybody here that can kind of pinpoint where the romp facility is gonna go and, and if it's, uh, I know it's gonna go about three quarters of a mile up from Rutgers place. Uh, would it show up on this map? Uh, this is just for my information uh, for future reference. Uh, Pat Young with the Planning Department. Commissioner Gibbs, the proposed ROM facility, and again, this is uh, proposed in the draft EIS by um, Go Triangle. There hasn't been any approvals granted. It would require um, a number of approvals from the city, uh, including a use permit and a rezoning. Um, but it's approximately a half mile to the north. Okay. Just under from, a half mile. From the intersection of Rutgers and Farrington? Correct. Okay. Uh, that's, that's good. Uh, you know, we have, this is what the third or fourth uh, review that we've had that involved uh, uh, development around proposed uh, transit stops. Uh, the first one was on the South Street. I, I think it's three or four. One was in the South Square area, and another one along 501, uh, where the and that we just approved that last at last meeting. Uh, but this one, I think, is probably exactly what is <coughs> being proposed. Uh, in, in all of the, the, the mixed use, the compact neighborhoods, uh, its, pro its proximity to the Lee Station. Uh, and I, I've looked over this, this thing. I really don't see any negatives. Uh, it has neighborhood uh, approval. Uh, so I, I think this is uh, a good uh, a good first step in uh, in development that's needed maybe to have some influence in Raleigh and everywhere else uh, if there is such a thing uh, but at any rate uh, it's a hopeful thing so I, I, I would support this um, and I would like to thank staff too for your for your work in in uh, reviewing this it's a uh, very helpful, as, as usual. Uh, that's all. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Commissioner Bugs. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I was also going to say I think the staff did an outstanding job with this report, and I really appreciate it. It's going to be very, it makes it much easier for us to be able to make informed decisions with the amount of information that was packaged in this proposal. I have one question for staff in particular. It's the bottom of page four of the staff report. We, it's the very last sentence, actually. It talks about the, um, the, the traffic capacity issue on Highway 54. It acknowledges that it, this isn't exactly adjacent to the development, but it, it will go above 110%. And then the final sentence says, However, staff finds the improvements identified in the attached TIA and committed to by the applicant to mitigate these potential impacts. I just wanted to get an explanation on how, how do we, how is that impact, how do we make sure we get under 110 percent? What, what is being done here to ensure that? And then after that, I have one other thing as well. Uh, I'm going to, Pat Young again with the planning department, I'm, I'm going to let Mr. Judge speak to that in a little more detail, but I, I want to say big picture, what we were trying to communicate there is that um, by using the term mitigate was that the impacts are, re are reduced by a number of the improvements that are being um, provided by the applicant through this proposal, but not below the, 
the threshold. And again, I can let Mr. Judge speak to the details. Uh, Bill Judge, transportation. Yes, the applicant did prepare a traffic impact analysis which looked at the peak hours of particularly Farrington 54 intersection. And uh, with the proposed improvements, it does provide an acceptable level of service, which is E here because of the transit station based on our comprehensive plan um, in those peak hours. Uh, would you reset the clock to two minutes? Thank you. Great, thank you. And then I was just going to say big picture, there's a lot in here that I really like and I, it's great to hear that the Neighborhood Association and neighbors are supportive of the proposal. I have to say I'm deeply concerned about the affordable housing goal to be at 14% currently, which is just below the 15% the goal that we set, and to then go down to 1.5% raises significant concerns for me. I think other folks will probably uh, raise that as well. So. Um, I, I, that's something that, that we may want to hear from the proponents, and, um, but again, I, in looking at this, that raises a, a big concern for me. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Freeman? So picking up on um, Mr. Busby's, uh, not Busby, as well. Busby. Busby. Busby's uh, comment, I want to specifically ask uh, staff how this is consistent on the housing basis if it doesn't meet that affordable housing percentage. So Pat Young again with the Planning Department. Um, our review um, that's presented in your staff report is very explicitly, and this is by the UDO, meaning we're required by the UDO to frame our recommendations, not our recommendations, our report um, by directly addressing adopted policies and ordinances. The 15% uh, of units within a half mile of each future transit area was a goal. And it may sound like a quibble, but it ha that's a significant distinction. There's not actually a policy or ordinance that implements that goal. It's simply a goal. Um, there's been ongoing efforts. You all have recently seen Texas Amendments to UDO. We have a consultant uh, under the direction of Community Development Department looking at future options to implement the goal. But since the goal is not an adopted policy or, or ordinance, it, it didn't result in us finding a lack of consistency with adopted policies or ordinances. So specifically to that, if there is no policy and there, and there is development happening around those transit area stations, would it be your suggestion that we hold off on approving development in that area to make sure that that policy is in place? So our role as staff is to analyze carefully the adopted policies and ordinances. I think you all have the discretion to look at city adopted goals and any other considerations that you all feel are in the public interest. But from a staff perspective, we don't have a basis to, to find any inconsistency with adopted policy or ordinance. And then I just have a question for the developer. I don't know how aware you are of the issues around gentrification in the city area and how we're losing the affordable housing that's available and recognizing that with transit, there is a specific population that is being left out of this development that's happening um, and going from Chapel Hill to Durham and stopping just east of Austin Avenue, I'm sorry, just west of Austin Avenue and not going east. Hmm. Um, would you by any chance be willing to consider uh, any affordable housing options within your planning? If you'll permit, I've prepared a statement that I'd like to read if that's okay and then maybe go a little more ad lib after that. Um, thank you for the question. Um, we have thought um, about this quite a bit. Um, we are aware of and pleased with the city's adopted goal for affordable housing. In light of the importance of this goal and our desire to support this goal as a private developer, I attended the city's affordable housing and transit workshop on May the 19th. I was truly impressed by the effort of the staff and the panel of experts who had gathered to present an objective perspective on how best to implement an affordable housing program in Durham that will promote the city's adopted goal of increasing affordable housing options, specifically near planned light rail transit stops. 
at the workshop, the staff explained that asking private developers to incorporate affordable housing into private multi-development projects creates a significant financial gap for the project. As a result of this financial gap, the project cannot be financed in the private market and therefore cannot move forward. Currently, the city has hired an experienced consultant to assist in creating a toolbox, which I thought was a, a great kind of picture in your mind, a toolbox of programs and incentives which would enable private developers to bridge the financial gap which currently prohibits a collaborative effort um, towards additional affordable housing units. At Wood Partners, we see the value and need for affordable housing for the residents of Durham, and specifically the benefit of having affordable housing near the light rail transit stops. We believe that once the city completes its housing and assessment plan, which is noted in your adopted goal, and prepares the transit station and neighborhood transit center plans for compact neighborhoods, which is also noted in your adopted goal, then the door will be open for meaningful private and public progress. I hope you will find evidence in our current proposal I hope you'll find evidence in our current proposal and throughout the staff report of our willingness to not only meet but exceed all city adopted plans, policies, and ordinances. And likewise, we look forward to being able to work with the city on its affordable housing initiative at such time as the city has um, developed a program with clear implementation guidelines. In the meantime, I know that may not be the answer you wanted to hear, but in the meantime, I believe our project contributes meaningfully towards the future of affordable housing in Durham by providing evidence that private developers can and will invest in high density rental housing near future transit stops. We're gonna be the first ones out of the ground here. You know, there's a lot left to be determined about the Lee Village Design District. And I think we're trying to show good faith by putting a foot forward in this area before anything else has really happened to say this is a great place for people to be in Durham. And, and not only great for residents, but great for developers to come and invest as well. So that's, that's what I've prepared. I know that may not have um, provided you exactly what you were looking for, but. Um, yeah. Another question, I'm sorry. So I just want to make sure I'm clear in understanding that what you're saying as a private developer, because the financing would be difficult for you to provide any affordable housing within your development, we're supposed to give you 671 units at market rate, and that's just because the, the resolution or the whatever, the ordinance that we have in place has not been adopted well, as a I policy. I think a um, couple of things. Um, okay. We've asked for five to 600 units, not 671, so it, it's a little less. Um, if you could put yourself in my shoes and try to imagine how to implement, let's say I were to offer something tonight, how, how would I go about doing that? There, there are no guidelines. Um, there, there's, no, there, there's no process by which it could be um, monitored or inspected by the city. Um, I think that, that if, I'm not sure how many of you were able to attend that hearing, um, it, was, it was fabulous. Um, the staff did an excellent, I, know, I saw you Mr. Gibbs, the staff did an excellent job of presenting the magnitude of the gap. The, the gap is quite large. Um, to ask for 15% of all those units to be provided at a certain um, income level creates such a gap that we cannot get the deal financed. Um, there are large institutional investors that join with us to build a project of this size. Um, each phase of our development will be 45 to $50 million, and we, we don't have that money ourselves. We get investors to come and do that. And the first thing they would ask is, so what's the program like in your city? You know, because they may have operated in D.C. or in other places where there's a program, and they can get the rules out and they can see how it works. They can see um, what we have to offer, um, you know, um, what kind of residents will be able to live with us, um, how we have to build that, how it's inspected as it's being constructed, how the um, payment system works after you've got it up and running. All of those things still have to be determined. And I have complete faith that Durham's headed in the right direction. I mean, you've hired an excellent consultant who really knows her stuff. And I think that ideally it won't take very long. I, I don't know, Pat, Pat, if you can speculate, but I think within the next 12 to 18 months, Durham's gonna have what it needs in place 
so that this can happen, this can be done. And we'll still be here. We've been here for a long time. We hope to continue to develop here for a long time to come. And we do believe in affordable housing. It's just there's not a mechanism. There's not literally a mechanism by which we can do it right now. Even if it were just 1%. If it were five units, it would show good faith effort, just so you know. Um, there's no, there's, again, there's no way to, like, based on, how, it's just like I don't have a mechanism based by which to Based on income. I, the only other thing I will say is that I, I, know, I know that the consultant has talked to the city in the work meetings at this point about not piecemealing a program together. So I would just ask perhaps that we not get into piecemealing when there's really not a plan in place. This would um, not be a part of the plan because the plan has not been established. This would be based on your development specifically and your development. Yeah. Would you be willing to offer mm -hmm. any affordable housing at all? No, I don't think and that we can do that. And, and it's, it's a very complicated matter. And it, in large part because we would not be able to secure investors who would be able to understand the program and prove that we could do it. We'd have to prove to them that we could, and I, and I can't do that right now with the city's um, lack of a mechanism. Commissioner Miller. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have a question of staff. Right now we have a planning process ongoing which includes creating a compact neighborhood tier in this area, is that correct? Can you tell us where that process is? Good evening, I'm Scott Wyden from the Planning Department. The, the, that planning process is scheduled for two more public meetings and then our, the draft recommendation will be presented to the commission next month and is scheduled for the public hearing in, at the Planning Commission in January. So it'll be probably early to mid-spring before the elected officials act on it. Mr. Chairman, if I may, uh, before, while Mr. Whiteman's still near the microphone, does that process also envision or contemplate that a compact neighborhood tier uh, at this location would be converted into a design district? That would be part of the future plans, but the this project would only uh, change the comprehensive plan to, to change this into a compact tier, and then at the future we would similar like we did in 9th Street work um, to rezone each of the compact tiers to a design district. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, and then I have a question for Ms. Anderson, if I may. Your development plan contemplates a significant parking structure. Can you describe that to me? Or I, at least the parameters that would control it? May I invite someone else to answer that? Sure. Who would like to answer that question about the parking structure? Yeah, typical. <laughs> Sorry, we, it's associated with the office. I apologize. No, that's fine. Good evening, Bob Zumwalt with McAdams. Um, would, you, would you restate? Please speak in the mic. Yeah, sure. Sorry about that. Bob Zumwalt with, uh, with McAdams. Um, I'm a landscape architect uh, working on the, the project with Wood Partners. Um, we read your signature a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully with, with kind thoughts. Um, we haven't designed the whole project yet, obviously, but with that level of office space and residential, what we're envisioning is there'd probably be two types of decks. The office component would probably have its own multi-level deck, and then the residential um, component on our side would, if we have a deck, it will be wrapped, if not completely, for the most part, it will be completely contained within, wrapped within a multi-story multi residential structure. And this concept of wrapping this deck, is that reflected? I didn't see that as a design commitment in the development plan. Is it there or didn't I miss it? The version that we get has very tiny print. Trying to peruse our design commitments. I think we had, Amy, didn't we have some reference to, we didn't have any? No, okay. I think we, oh, here we did. We, what, we, what we did mention about the deck was that the finish and the materials would be designed to complement the aesthetics of the building, so. And that you wouldn't have a roof, that's all I saw yeah, that's on right. the top. Uh, to this, at this point, before anything's been designed, that's all we've kind of committed to, yeah. And if I may, Mr. Chairman, another question for uh, the developer's design team. Uh, I understand that you've worked out some arrangements with the neighborhood to 
uh, soften the impact, how are those, or what are those arrangements and how are they reflected in the development plan commit design commitments? Um, oh, I don't have that with me. Um, yes, I do. Hang on. No, I don't. Um, so we've worked with um, Mr. Eady in particular on, uh, so as you can see, there's nine or 10 or 12 current tax commitments. A number of those will be um, revised uh, and a number of things that we've worked on with Mr. Eady are not really appropriate for tax commitments. So we've have, we've. Well, tell me what they are is really the base of the question. Right, so um, we will be um, using a 20 foot evergreen buffer across from him. Uh, we will also, um, on any building that is within a certain distance of his property, uh, we will probably, we will be using, um, we will not have open porches and balconies. We would use sunrooms. Um, if there is a pocket park in the northern end of the property, we will um, set that up as a passive pocket park um, with um, no playground and no outdoor music venue, um, quieter activities such as a garden or um, a, a seating area. Um, if we have a pet, uh, like a dog park, that will be fenced so that the animals can't kind of run around all over. Um, he asked also about lighting. And um, we've determined that the code is um, adequate for covering the lighting that would be required to keep lights from shining into the property. Um, and I think we had a couple of other, uh, I'm trying to think if there's anything else that couldn't be listed. Mm -hmm. I, think, I think what happened is a couple of things too were already required by the code. And so we were able to meet um, his wishes by the code. So which of those are not appropriate for design commitments in your opinion? They are, what we hope to do is we have some of those are there now, and some of them we hope to install between now and the city council meeting um, in working with Amy to have um, those added and drafted, which uh, Mr. Eady has agreed to do with us because we we thought originally that we could do those in a, we thought we could work with a, a sort of a side document or other kind of legal document, and then we all agreed that they could be and should be text commitments. And so we have to work, I think we didn't want to cut and paste with our language. We wanted to work with Amy this week uh, before she preps her report for city council so that those tax commitments can be drafted in a way that the city can enforce. Uh, and I think Mr. Eady would confirm that he and I have an understanding and Bob has read those and helped us draft them, but we do need staff to look over them and tweak them and get them into a form that's acceptable to the city. Uh, thank you. And then finally, uh, can you tell me how tall the buildings will be, especially in there, in what is the northern uh, portion of the property um, we maximum building height. I can't mm, yes yeah, so without yeah. you have to. Be, they're not going to be any taller than four-story buildings no. and so probably a, about a 60-foot high building no, the way it's way, so, the way the city measures we do it. we do yeah. not nine to ten foot ceilings with a you know foot and a half in between um, we haven't actually programmed the site that specifically yet waiting to see if it were rezoned um, but the buildings at the northern end would be um, three story, some would be three story in height. And then as you start to move southward, because the apartments will be at the northern end, as you start to move southward, we hope to approach four story. Um, and a portion of that will be surface parked. Um, and then as you move even further south um, with our second phase, we hope to be able to do a wrap deal. And to answer your earlier question, generally the apartment units wrap the deck so that neither the residents nor the neighbors are looking at the deck. Are you proposing wood frame construction? We will, yes, we will be doing stick frame construction. Mm -hmm. And um, we'll, uh, never mind, thank you. Uh, those are uh, my questions, Mr. Chairman. Commissioner Winders. Uh, I have a lot of questions. Hit your uh, mic, <laughs> turn your mic on. Um, oh, I thought, I thought it was on. The, for staff, I would, how did we, I'd like to ask, how did we get to using the, the um, design district standards when, when we haven't even uh, made the compact tier and we're, we're still in the, actually in the suburban tier to start off with? Amy Wolf with the Planning Department. Th this project, this application was not reviewed under the design district st um, standards. Okay. The applicant has committed to compact tier, neighborhood tier standards, which is uh, admissible with this application. With the, with the development plan. Correct. This okay. was not reviewed against design district standards. Okay. So um, what is the, um, 
Well, I thought I saw something in there about that was compact. Maybe I got mixed up between the design district and the compact tier standards. <laughs> but um, uh, the, what do you call it, vertical integration? What, what effect does that have on the having vertical integration? What effect does that have on, on densities that are allowed and, and uh, the standards that are applied? Sure, the vertical integration uh, permits the, a mixed-use project to use the entirety, entire acreage of the project for uh, density calculations and would allow for, um, in this case, 42 units per acre because it would be considered support area. Uh, so that would be the maximum permitted in this instance with the commitment to vertical integration and the compact here. So for, what is the 42 would be? The maximum. The, the maximum with the integra uh, vertical integration? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And without it, what would it be? Uh, I believe it's 17. Without okay. the commitment for vertical integration. I believe yeah. it's 17. I have to check that. Okay. Um, so um, about the vertical inter integration, what, what is, uh, it seems, this is going to be um, office and residential? Is that only? Like restaurants? And, and what is going to explain how the, ver the, the what the mixed uses are and how the vertical in integration is? What's okay. going to be vertically integrated? Okay. <laughs> so, well, I asked the same question early on. Um, we uh, elected to use the two mixed use designation instead of three mixed uses. So the two uses will be residential and office. And um, there will be an office building at the southernmost end of the site. And then in our project, we which is primarily residential, we will be integrating some office space. So the vertical integration will occur with office and apartments mixed in the same building. So where There will do you be no retail though. It's not there, we didn't add a third use, so there's no commercial component. Where do you anticipate that the people that live in these 600 units are going to be um, going to, um, going out to eat and getting their hair fixed and their dry cleaning done, mm -hmm. et cetera? Well, we're pretty close. It's not going to be on site, right? No, we're pretty close to South Point Mall. I mean, we have a few restaurants right at that intersection, but we're pretty close to South Point Mall. Um, it's also not too hard to get into East 54 and Chapel Hill, um, and there are a number of grocery stores within a mile in in a couple different directions. So I think it's I think that will be okay. So how is this going to be a walkable community? Well, we're just the catalyst. I mean, I tried to make that point. We are the, we are the beginning of what will be, I think, I think Lee Village is approximately 300 acres. I mean, over the next many years, you will be seeing um, a mixture of uses come to Lee Village. We are just the first, and we're on the very edge. Um, and we're near <laughs> the intersection, which um, we will be bringing a number of improvements to to get that so that it's functioning properly as we um, build our product out. But I think over time, you're going to see all of the land to the north and to the west is where the majority of the Lee Village Design District will be. And the transit stop is kind of like 10 or 11 o'clock from our deal, about a quarter mile in. Um, and we're prepping the roadways to have the appropriate widths and the, and the sidewalks and the bike paths and everything will be able to go in that direction over time. So you said you're a national firm, uh, and but you have this is your first transit-oriented development. Right? No, it's actually our second. It's our first mixed-use project. What we've done before, we did um, years ago um, over at Ninth Street. We built Station Nine, and we worked with the City of Durham. At that time, the highest density you could build multifamily was about 20 units to the acre, and that was considered like high density. Um, so the categories were like 8, 12, and 20. Um, so we spent about a year working with the city to help them um, draft new language that would allow those categories to go up. Then we spent another year rezoning our property, and then we spent another two years building that property. And it was high density, but it did not have any retail on the first floor. It did not have any office integrated. So there was no, there was no integration. So, the, so at this point, we're coming back to you and with what I'm calling more of a true mixed-use development. It'll be for us, it'll be our first mixed-use development. Mm -hmm. um, we've been primarily doing um, just purely residential. Um, but this is more appropriate for this area, and it's kind of where Durham is headed in a number of ways. I mean, at this point, you, have, you only have these opportunities for residents in downtown Durham at this point. That's where the, that's where the higher density apartment deals are. And so we're going to be opening up a whole new pocket of Durham for um, high density and, and help promote this transit stop, which if you think about it, you've got some traction over in downtown. You have some traction at Ninth Street. You're going to be getting some traction at Patterson Place. And this is the next one. Um, and so we're trying to kind of kick start what could happen in that area. Yeah. 
And, and then about the affordable housing, um, I, was, I was really happy to see the analysis, at least in the, in the um, staff report, and, uh, and I'm glad that at least the developers are aware that the resolution is there. I don't really find your, your uh, explanation that you can't uh, do anything about it because the, the city hadn't made the guidelines yet very convincing, though, and I, I think there, there is a mechanism for monitoring it in the incentive that was passed last, uh, recently in the um, uh, density at, with a density bonus for uh, aff affordable housing. I think that opens the door to build it. That, I don't think that has anything to do with how it's monitored for the long term and how the city manages that program. And for what it's worth, we're able to secure the density, whether it's right or wrong, we're able to secure the density that we need in this area. Um, we don't need the density bonus. Because uh, we the, also the, don't it's all, the ordinance is already generous enough without your uh, using the density um, bonus? Yes and no. Well, it offers other things like a parking reduction, which frankly I'm not sure that makes a lot of a sense. I mean, I don't think affordable residents don't have cars, you know, so there are some things that need to be sort of worked out. Right now, the incentives to developers aren't very effective. Um, and at the presentation that I went to, I was, um, I was actually kind of blown away with the number of tools that could be put in the toolkit. And I think, you know, Pat, you were there and several of you were there. There, there are dozens of things that the city could look at doing um, that's being done in other cities around the country. Some of them are things where you would, you would kick in, some of them we kick in, some of them we work together. And um, I think because you have a consultant here who's done it before, she'll be able to pick and choose the ones that are right for Durham. And then at that point, we move forward with, with whatever is decided to be you know, that, that toolbox. And it would give developers some options. Maybe I get some impact fees waived. Uh, maybe we offer units and, and we work out how the, how the funding of those goes. You know, the, there will be some tools. There will be good tools in the toolbox eventually. We have a real high expectation for this uh, three or four month consultant study. Huh? I think another thing that's difficult and challenging, um, when you look at the stat, and I know it was, it was disappointing to me, um, you're starting at 14% in this pocket and we're dropping it to one, and I would simply ask you to remember that the basis of the study starts with 70 units. You have 70 units. That's it. Exactly. Right, but we're adding 600, exactly. right? And that means that before long, other developers are gonna come along. You have 300 acres. So maybe the others will do all affordable no, housing. They don't and need then, to. Then. They don't need to, I, I just, I feel confident I'm, I really do believe, I feel confident, that 300 acres is gonna be developed. You have to just look down the road. It's gonna be developed around that transit center and there will be plenty, plenty of opportunity for this to work out to where it makes sense for everybody to be able to do it. Um, I think the path is getting cleared and the important part is that you adopted a goal and now you're on um, a, time, a time, a track. You're on a track, you're on a path and it won't be long before you get there to where there's a toolbox that makes sense. Um, and I would encourage all of you to go look at the slides. They're posted online for the work that the planning staff did. They asked city help. I was there. They asked self-help to come in and run the numbers and the self-help spent like 45 minutes working through the numbers and it was, it was pretty clear when you look at that, the challenge that's there for both public and private. Right now there's a really big challenge. There's a financial gap that it would be nice to, to pretend doesn't exist, but it does and we have to address it and figure out how to deal with it together. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> Commissioner Ghost. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I want to echo uh, comments made by some of the other commissioners. The staff did a wonderful job with this report. Also, thank you for changing my name tag. Appreciate that. Uh, um, I don't really have a question, but I did want to comment on this. Um, part, I, I think everyone up here understands that uh, affordable housing is an issue in Durham, um, but I think it's not so clear. It, it's not a developer issue. It is a Durham issue. Uh, there's a reason that developers aren't able to put in affordable housing. I think what uh, Ms. Anderson is saying is I, I would echo that very much. We should also recognize that at this project in particular, uh, they are doing significant road improvements and infrastructure improvements, which make, which add cost to the project, would make it, you know, further, more difficult for them to incorporate things like affordable housing in this project. I think it's a great project, and as uh, Ms. Anderson mentioned, uh, there are 300 acres or so uh, in this uh, neighborhood plan, and uh, not not in this plan, but in the uh, entire, um, what is it? I'm sorry? Yeah, in the compact district. And um, 
you know, hopefully with infrastructure improvements that we're seeing here and the commitment to the transit-oriented development, we will start to see um, uh, affordable housing units develop. But, I mean, I, I'm not really seeing a way for it to happen in this particular development. That's really all I had to say. <coughs> Are they of the kind of Commissioner Huff? And Commissioner Huff has joined us. Mm -hmm. was, was she here in the beginning? Yeah. Um, I have a question for, um, I guess, planning. What is the median income in that area? Was that at the um, uh, affordable housing? What is the median income? So, Commissioner Huff, we, we did look at that data point when we calculated the percent of affordable housing, but I don't have that available. I could certainly follow up with you all. Um, I think the key point is what Ms. Anderson alluded to, which is there's only 70 residential units in the area, so the, the base is, is very is low. low. Um, a, a question also for you all. Uh, retroactively, can affordable housing be added to this project after the uh, units are built if there is an incentive like a tax abatement or some other kind of? It's certainly possible depending on the tool that's used. I think Ms. Anderson's characterization is, has been fair about where the city's at in the development mm -hmm. of, of tools particularly more robust tools where there's more direct participation by the city, and that's probably what that would take. But is it possible? Certainly. There's nothing that prohibits it. Okay. Thanks. Commissioner Freeman. So I just want to make one more comment in saying that I think the development is a great step in the right direction. I think that the improvements, as, as Commissioner Gosh mentioned, are great. I love the way you're working together with your neighbor. The issue is more so the affordable housing and the fact that this is just the beginning of the wave. It could happen in the next 18 months and we will not have a, a policy in place as you mentioned and we will have the same conversation with every developer that, com that came in, the same that we've had with the Irwin Road and with, um, the, there were two others, but we can't continue to give away rezoning in this city and expect for things to change. And that's just the issue for me. I, I just can't continue to say yes to rezoning and not do anything about affordable housing. It's just not acceptable. In the Commissioner Miller. I guess I feel uh, to a certain extent the same way uh, that Commissioner Freeman feels. Uh, to me, this project seems to be jumping in front of a lot of important planning initiatives uh, that this project could be part of and contribute to. Uh, but by being ahead of it, we're losing community opportunities uh, to guide development in a way to accomplish uh, Durham's uh, identified goals, which have to be translated into, into more concrete policies. But all of these policies are on the way. Uh, we have a compact tier planning process uh, underway right now for this area. Why don't we wait until we finish that process instead of approving things that, that will, instead of approving things that will, in my opinion, might even work as impediments to that, to the successful completion of that process, we could f complete the process and then consider how this property should be used and then and so it'll complement rather than impede it. We have an affordable housing uh, program underway and we're trying to create policies for that. The developer uh, herself says uh, that she doesn't know how to do affordable housing because Durham hasn't told her how. Uh, well, then maybe we should wait because this is an affordable, this is 600 units. This is an affordable housing opportunity, especially around transit stops. We have the goal. Um, Quite frankly, uh, I'm not sure that we will have light rail, and it worries me. Uh, I do not necessarily see what happened in the General Assembly as necessarily a good sign. Uh, I think that when the legislature reconvenes, it'll be, the, for the most part, the same legislators. Uh, they will have the same concerns, and I think a bill that instead of being introduced at the last minute is introduced at the first minute uh, may pass and we may not have a light rail system and I'm a little worried about putting all of our eggs in the light rail basket. Uh, quite frankly, uh, Mr. Judge, I believe if I understood him correctly said that without light rail in this 
project, then we'd be exceeding the 110% standard for Highway 54, in which case we're going against our own policies. I would like to feel better about light rail than I do right now. Uh, I mean, that was quite a blow, and the objection that the members of the General Assembly seemed to have was not the, the, the policy, but it was in the timing and the way it was introduced into the budget. Uh, it was procedure that they didn't like. It wasn't policy, and it worries me very, very much. Um, I would like to see what this development plan looks like at the planning commission level. And to me, there are a lot of commitments that basic commitments in mixed use development that are missing. We talked about building height. We talked about uh, wrapping parking structures. We talked about the things you've worked out with the, with the neighbors. All of those should have been in this development plan for our consideration. I will, Mr. Chairman, thank you. So I would like to see at least a 60-day delay, a two-term delay on this so that we can get at least some of this wrapped up and finally, I say to the developer, uh, just because we don't, we, the city of Durham, don't have guidelines to tell you how to do affordable housing, there are examples where developers in Durham have included develop affordable housing commitments that they made up themselves. Uh, they may not be the ones we want that we design later, uh, but at least it'll be affordable housing that we don't have. Uh, so I ask you to look at that. It doesn't have to be 15%. It could be two percent it could be three units thank you mr. chairman the was your disposition chair will entertain a motion mr. chairman I'd like to make a motion uh, if I may uh, I move that we defer action on this rezoning request for a period uh, well until our uh, December meeting um, second motion readiness point of clarification mr. chair and uh, and I guess Commissioner Miller um, d just to clarify would would a continuance be acceptable versus pardon me I, I said it's, it's the old lawyer thing a continuance is what I mean I don't mean to start the public hearing over again a continuance uh, I would like to see a more complete development plan uh, I second okay okay so the motion on the floor is for a continuance of this for 60 days. Could we hear a roll call? Oh. Or do we need have a discussion? Okay. <laughs> I asked for unreadiness. Yeah. I just think that because uh, uh, it would be a good idea to have some time to, to see if we could work out some plans for affordable housing, plus the fact that these commitments, these tax commitments are missing. You know, this, this application should be complete before we approve it, you know, before we recommend it, you know, you, you're, the deadline for having the application done is the planning commission meeting, not the, not the city council meeting, in my opinion. Okay, I will allow you to speak. Okay. <laughs> Again, Bob. Normally I don't. Okay. Bob's somewhat with McAdams. Just, just one thing I wanted to mention, a lot of the reason that um, the, these commitments are on the plan is that because we have we've already worked all this out with the with the neighbors and so there's there's no there's no there's nothing between us that there's any concern that we're not going to commit to that so we didn't feel like that was an issue at all with regard to height the height is limited on the development plan with regard to um, things like concealing a deck I mean this is probably the fifth or sixth mixed-use high-density deck wrap I've worked on none of which ever had any of that in their text commitments some things are driven by the market I mean, when you build this level of density, the only way you get it to rent and feel like a class A space is you do things like you either dress the decks up with high level finishes, which we have committed to, or that's the only way you can get this sort of density and get, you know, market rate rents for class A space is they have to comply with what the market is accepting, which is wrapping these projects, these decks with, with the building. So it's, I don't feel it's accurate to say this is in, incomplete. I don't. I feel like we could have, uh, we have neighborhood support from Mr. Eady with, with just a, a letter agreement, but we just feel like to do him justice, we should put those on the plan. I don't think that it was necessary, you know, to do it ahead of the planning commission meeting because we really do want to keep moving with the project. So, thank if you're going to speak, speak to the motion and not the comments that he made. Speak to the motion 
that's on the floor and not to the comments that he made. I'm not sure I understand what you mean, Mr. Chairman, uh, but I will note, however, that when we worked on Station 9, there was a text commitment in the development plan to wrap okay, the Okay, you're not day. speaking to the, to the motion. Well, okay. <laughs> to the motion, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. I think, I think back then the way that you processed um, plans with the city was completely different. I, I do believe that we produced development plans at that point in time which had to show building footprints okay. and they no the longer motion, ask for those the things. The motion on the floor is for a continuance. It, Speak could you, to if the motion and not I would like to know um, specifically what I am supposed to work on for you during the 60 days. If you could be clear about that or follow up with me after that would be helpful. The, what he was stating was all the tax amendments that you had mentioned is not in our report. It's the about a sentence and a half that we could present. I found it and I can read incomplete. it to you if you'd like. I have, I have it in my folder and could read it to you if you would like that. No. No. Any other comments? If we could hear the clerk call, again, the motion on the floor is to continue this request for a 60-day continuance. Well, we want a more complete uh, report, yes. Yeah. Yes. Mr. Ghosh? No. Mr. Busby? Aye. Mr. Gibbs? No. Ms. Hyman? No. Ms. Freeman? Aye. Ms. Huff? Mr. Harris? Aye. Mr. Keenchin? No. Mr. Miller? Aye. Mr. Riley? Mr. Van? Aye. Ms. Winders? Winders? Aye. It carries eight to four. Thank you. <clears throat> and now, before I before I go into how I'd like for uh, if Miss Grace Smith would join me at the podium over here. Uh, <clears throat> I like a recognition the North Carolina Association of Zoning Officials has recognized one of our staff members for the <clears throat> outstanding uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, the outstanding member of the year of the North Carolina uh, Association of Zoning. And uh, this was done at the 34th Annual Conference in Wilmington. And Ms. Smith is the first member of the association to have received this honor two times. And uh, she, was, <laughs> she was awarded this recognition in 2011. And also back in 2008, she received the uh, official, she was the, the zoning official of the year. She received the zoning official of the year. So this is the kind of talent we have here in Durham. And thank you for. Oh, well, thank you. <laughs> I, haven't even, I haven't even seen that. So. Hi. <laughs> Okay, uh, Mr. Stop. 
Uh, thank you, Chair, <laughs> members of the Planning Commission. Uh, before you is just an informational item uh, for Texas MMTC 1501. Um, on a yearly or slightly more than a year basis, we bring to you a set of technical and minor policy changes um, in a lump sum uh, for consideration by this board and then on with the elected officials and also uh, consistent with at least when as I've been uh, responsible for these text amendments to bring them to you generally larger text amendments like these or some other topics bring them to you at least a month in advance so you can kind of digest them have more time to digest them you're welcome um, and then have more thoughtful discussions questions what have you uh, after you've had time to look them over since they are numerous in pages if, if not in amount um, I'll be happy uh, the report that accompanies this is is pretty straightforward and specific um, be happy to answer any questions now I know that there was questions about the uh, affordable housing um, uh, you could always just lead into that if you'd like but I'd be happy to answer any questions mm -hmm. So okay, do we have questions of uh, So within the next sixty days, wait a second, exactly wait a second, how wait a second. Okay. I have Freeman Miller, anyone else have questions? Right now. Okay. Freeman. So within the next sixty days speaking uh, of mine. Within the next sixty days, how much of um, the affordable housing, I guess, policy do you think we could get? I think we'll save that discussion for the next item on your agenda, which is okay. um, what Ms. Winders had, had uh, alluded, asked to discuss. Um, we will bring this actually back to you in November for the public hearing. So okay. it'll be a month time. Commissioner Miller. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have about three questions. The first one uh, concerns uh, the historic district landmark, uh, historic district or landmark designation, the initiation process under our current rules to initiate a district uh, if a petition signed by the owners of 25 percent or some percentage of the of the property in the proposed district uh, submit a petition then it automatically starts the process this would add a, st a procedural step making the that petition go to the appropriate governing board uh, for discretionary decision on whether to move forward or not is that correct that's correct um, I guess my problem with that is, is right now, uh, that discretionary process, one person can ask, who doesn't even have to be a property owner, can ask the governing board to initiate uh, the creation of a historic district. So it seems like we are having redundant procedures with no particular point <coughs> if we do it that way. In other words, under the Constitution, anybody can ask the city council to exercise its authority, and we have two ways of doing it, city initiated and by citizen-initiated. This turns the citizen-initiated uh, process into a city-initiated process by a request, and anybody can request it. So I'm, I, I think maybe the thing to do would be to just do away with the citizen-initiated process and rather than to have a, an overlapping in procedure. Uh, my, I kind of looked into this a little bit. My recommendation, Winston-Salem has a great way of doing citizen-initiated historic districts that takes into account this question of, of whether or not, because, you know, the citizens initiate it, but then the staff has to do it. The city expends resources. It's this whole question of resource expenditures that I know that you're getting at. I think the Winston-Salem ordinance actually contemplates this in a way that in my opinion is a little bit more orderly than what we're proposing so I between now and then I'd like we can, to we can definitely that. take a look at it I'll consult with uh, historic preservation staff and those who are a little bit more knowledgeable about the reasoning behind it and we'll see if, if the other thing way to do it. Um, uh, if, And then let me ask, uh, can you explain to me the change to the neighborhood meeting proposal? This is 3.2. This is a, a lot of us have kind of watched this neighborhood proposal thing and the way it's, I mean the neighborhood meeting thing, the way it's performed over the last few years. And um, 
and I was I want to understand this change and at some point I would like to say that it, maybe it's time to review what happens there I'm not sure that it always is a it always ends up being a good thing for the people who, who have to go through the process. Why are we, if, it, if a comprehensive plan amendment is not inclu is included, then you don't have to have the neighborhood meeting. I'm not sure I understood the policy it's, behind it's, that. It's to be consistent with the notification requirements, so you're not getting a notification for a neighborhood meeting when the actual zoning map change that doesn't have a comprehensive plan goes out, only goes out to 600 feet, so there's a disconnect between the two. So it's, it's trying to remove any confusion as why I got a neighborhood meeting for a proposal where I don't get an actual notice proposal for the zoning map change because there's other there's other instances where a neighborhood meeting is needed, not necessarily with a comp comprehensive Would, plan. Wouldn't it be better then to make the radius reconcile rather than to drop those people out of the neighborhood meeting? Well, that's a different. That's a whole different policy issue in terms of expanding. Well, I was expanding actually it. talking about making it shorter, not bigger. But, no. um, and then something else I saw in here, Mr. Chairman, if you don't mind, I appreciate your, the, everybody's. Um, If you would look at 6-8 infill development residential districts, the corner lot standards, is this because of the problem that came up in Trinity Heights? Um, no, it's been an ongoing issue. I'm not familiar with the problem with Trinity Heights. That's but where an alleyway separated in the, in, in the litany of, of standards for setbacks for corner lots under those circumstances. There wasn't actually a, a provision in the code. That right, it. and it's a corner lot, the corner lot issue has been something that's been ongoing and it's always been discussed that we need to do something with about how we address corner lots. Where there are alleys. And, and also where there are alleys, so yes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Those are the questions I had. Any other questions? Commissioner Huff. <clears throat> I notice um, there, isn't any, uh, there isn't any adjustment here. Or any, uh, you haven't broached the, the problem of renters and people occupying property 600 feet. I thought that uh, planning, the planning department was going to get together maybe with uh, Chapel Hill, some, what's his name, Prouty or Proop, Proop, Marty Proop to come up with some way to notify people uh, that not, are not property owners that are living yeah. uh, near rezoning? I'm not particularly aware of that discussion. Uh, we can, again, check with administration and see where that, if there is, if there was discussion Do you remember that, that coming do, up? Do you, are you familiar um, with that, Pat? I'm afraid I'm not familiar with what you're referring to, Commissioner Huff. We, we do share information um, with Chapel Hill staff in, in their notification, joint notification mm -hmm. area, and I know there was some, at least some discussion about notification of um, occupants, but there wasn't but adequate policy. nothing has ever been drawn up about it. No, there, we didn't feel like there was adequate policy direction to pursue that. It's a sub substantial additional cost without <laughs> policy direction, so we didn't include it in this. Any other comments? If not, this is just information. Just informational. All right. Thank, Thank you. you. The next thing we have on our agenda is uh, 6B, the consideration of uh, language for affordable housing. So um, this, this kind of overlaps with the previous uh, uh, item, um, and in that, um, I wonder if this is, would not be an appropriate uh, addition to the text amendments. Uh, and uh, this, this uh, when we had, when we considered the affordable housing parking and density bonus text amendment back in July, I think it was, our, at our, um, um, the, after, <coughs> after the planning board meeting met, the, the Coalition for Affordable Housing and transit uh, discussed that the the uh, this this uh, this text amendment and decide, decided that we really wanted that text amendment to go a lot. I mean those those incentives and that toolbox, you know, for encouraging affordable housing to go a lot farther than it went. But we realized that there is 
uh, a whole lot of work involved in getting it as far as it went. <laughs> and it would take another big hunk of, of staff time and work program time and everything to add more to it. So we didn't want to hold up what was there just because it wasn't enough, you know. But we did think that at least modifications should be made to the, de to the, to the definitions and the purposes of the zoning districts to, because the existing definitions of the of the uh, compact neighborhood and the comp and the um, com the design districts, urban design districts, you know, just talk about um, density, and we we believe that that um, it's not, and and I believe that that is not what the community thinks. You know, that is not the community's vision of these urban neighborhoods. It's not just, it, it makes it, and some of our, the planning, the reports and recommendations, you know, sound like we just want density for the sake of density, you know? And I think it's not just any density that is desirable. And that, and so uh, we tried to add in the idea of of equity and not just land use diversity in the multi-use category, but also socioeconomic diversity and income diversity. So we don't want just a mix of, of land uses, a mix of having, having a residential and office and, and retail, but we want to have a variety of income levels in uh, in the developments. That's what makes a vibrant urban neighborhood, not just the, the buildings, you know? So, um, and this, uh, we weren't trying to, to uh, you know, uh, um, take over pl the planning department's job by making up these, these um, actual changes here. They're uh, wor the wording of the regulations, but just thinking that it was it was a small change, you know. <laughs> it doesn't have any real dollars and cents effect, uh, but that and uh, that it would take very little staff time to put to add this on to the, the an amendment that's already there. So um, we uh, and uh, so we made uh, this statement. I made this statement for the coalition to both the city council meeting and the uh, county commissioner's meeting. And um, they both were generally supportive of the idea and agreed that the current language did not really reflect the values of the community. Uh, but, and the county commissioners actually took a vote saying, we, real, we can't add it to at this time because that you gotta, there are all these rules about notification and you have to, put in the public notices, you have to put out um, uh, what articles are changed, and we were proposing changes to a different article that wasn't mentioned in the public notice. So we couldn't add it to this one, but the county commissioners, you know, voted on adding it to another update or reviewing the language and uh, adding it to another update. So I thought that this would be the, this, uh, uh, omnibus text changes would be an ideal one to stick it on to, and uh, since so, I wondered if we uh, could could make uh, make that recommendation. And since we weren't asked to vote about the, it's just informational about the text amendment. Uh, uh, so I just uh, thought maybe we could make a motion and and uh, and I'd like to hear from staff about you know what what is what is the are there any what do you think about adding it to the omnibus text amendment? Thank you, Commissioner Winders and, and members of the commission. Pat Young again with the planning department. Um, we, we certainly heard uh, loud and clear the feedback that um, the board of commissioners particularly and city council gave uh, Commissioner Winders uh, on this issue and we took um, this proposal that is at your dais and I think you received the email yesterday um, along with several other um, potential text amendments to the Joint City County Planning Committee. Uh, Chair Harris was present along with three city council members and three county commissioners at that September meeting of that body and, and went to them and, and asked if there was any interest in modifying our current year work program to include um, 
this scope and, and there, there was not any. So since this was not included in our current year work program, we, we certainly uh, and have every intent to uh, consider this for inclusion in our FY17 work plan. Uh, specifically, uh, as I think you all are well aware, we, we have brought you all and, and they've both been adopted by council and the commissioners. Um, what we felt were the uh, all effective and legal UDO changes that would pertain to affordable housing, which was the density bonus and the uh, parking reduction for affordable housing. Um, we did not feel like there were any other, at that time, effective and legal tools under North Carolina law that could be incorporated into the UDO, which is, a, of course, a regulatory tool. Um, so what we want to do in preparation of FY17 is look at the language that the coalition has provided us, but also look in detail at the comprehensive plan, the work that comes out of the community development department and the consultant that you heard about earlier tonight, um, more consultation with our legal staff, and figure out what is uh, really going to be most is both legal and effective uh, for, for language uh, rather than just intent statements. So we, we the no we we all certainly can adopt any resolution you like, but the we discussed this at some length with the director, and at this time there's no in, intention of incorporating this uh, prior to FY17 year. Commissioner Bell. Pat, these are just changes to the intent statements of these several districts. Is that right? They are. So if this, and you haven't issued uh, any notices yet for the omnibus text changes. That's correct. So I'm not sure I understand what the harm is in adding this to that notice so that uh, the public can review this, talk about it, and then even modify it if we need to because they are just intent statements. Actually, I find the intent statements to, to be strong guidance, but they never appear in staff reports or anything. I'm just not sure I understand what the harm or the objection is uh, to getting this in this process so that it might be discussed uh, and not waiting yet another year. Um, and if I may, Mr. Chairman, I have another question. Uh, and this one is of, of Rebecca. Let me make a comment before you make the question. It was the chair's intent that the planning commission go on record supporting language for affordable housing. So you want, it's my, my impression that you wanted us to vote to approve this, that we are in support of language for affordable housing. Ex excuse me, Mr. Chairman, I believe I had the floor. <laughs> I'm trying to get an understanding. You, you want our support for this document, right? Yes, I, 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 I would, I think. You know, unless I would have wanted to discuss it and see what, how, uh, what people thought was the right thing to do, but okay. I think All we right. should, I'd like to see us have a motion about it, yeah. Uh, Commissioner Bill. Rebecca, has the coalition uh, come up with language or a resolution that might modify the comprehensive plan with regard to affordable housing? Actually, that the uh, where the compact neighborhood tier there are the it, since it was only you know this is it's even a whereas to add a whereas to the to the original text am uh, amendment there. This is an amendment to the amendment kind of. Actually, I'm, you, I'm I'm talking about the comprehensive plan, not yeah, the video. But the the compact neighborhood tier is is in the UDO. But it is, um, uh, that is a restatement of language in the comprehensive plan. So uh, I understand. It's a little, I, there are a few changes, but I, you know. I understand that, but I'm yeah. actually talking so about specifically. I did, we did not specifically discuss trying to, to asking for a complete, uh, uh, a new amendment of the comp comprehensive plan. Uh, this was just thought to be a little addition to something that would not take a six-month study. <laughs> it would not take more than a couple of hours of staff time <laughs> to, uh, uh, you know, to put, put, it, put it in there. So, no, it's, it should be in the, it should be done to the comprehensive plan, too, though. I will say that at the county commissioner's meeting, uh, they did talk about when are we going to revise the whole comprehensive plan 
And I think, I forget what the answer to that question was, but it was kind of agreed that it's time to be revising the whole comprehensive plan. And, you know, the next couple of year or two, we're going that will, you, will show up on the work plan probably. And I have one final question, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Pat, in, in, in light of what you told us about uh, <clears throat> the staff's intention, the director's intention, the action taken by the, uh, the JCCPC, were the Planning Commission to adopt a resolution tonight asking that this language uh, be included in the, uh, omnibus, in the notice for the omnibus text changes, uh, what would happen if we did that? How would, you, how would the staff respond? How would this be communicated to the elected boards? Sure, we, we would make sure that your resolution was provided to the elected boards and the administrations. Uh, and if we received direction to modify it, we, we would, but otherwise we would proceed forward as was presented to you tonight as an informational item. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Pat. Uh, Mr. Chairman, under those circumstances, I move. Uh, Wait, did you have a comment? Okay. Okay, Commissioner Gibbs. Uh, by any chance, could this be described, uh, Becky, or, and to anybody as some sort of justification for uh, for the proposed uh, affordable housing guidelines, uh, which has to do probably w as much with sticks and stones and units, density and all of that. Uh, could that be what this uh, uh, a point of support for that uh, I, I'm just trying to understand a reason for it I don't see any reason to not include it except if we're going to include all of these I would like to see an inclusion of uh, persons with disabilities that's <laughs> if we're going to start doing all of these things uh, I, I don't want to leave out any any public contingent uh, it's uh, even though the the ADA covers just about anything and I was going to mention it to one of the the review tonight but anyway uh, that's my question uh, could it be construed as uh, as that if, if I've made myself clear or muddy or whatever. I think that would be a good addition. Didn't think about putting it in there. <laughs> but this, basically, this, this added verbiage uh, seems to sort of justify uh, what's being proposed uh, that would anybody comment on that as, or is it not necessary well to me it just it seems like a, you know the the it sort of puts the issue a little bit front and center if I were a developer writing this justification for why my project is a good project when I you know I see the intent of the of the zone zoning district that I'm applying for uh, you know, I, and I see an expectation for equity and and socioeconomic diversity. I, you know, I just I think it might change. And plus, I it's um, might give us a more um, a stronger legal legal basis to make a decision on on um, whether on voting down a proposal that doesn't have affordable housing in it yeah I, but I'm I, not a lawyer I can't say well I, I, I would agree with that and that. I, I was just try looking for some some kind of explanation for it I I have no reason to not include it it's a uh, but generally speaking everything that we've discussed tonight on the, on the review of the development and on this and even though we have hired when I say we, the city and county has hired a consultant, I would bet you money it would be two to three years before anything can be codified 
and all of the issues settled so that when we have a review before us, there will be A, B, C, and D. If you don't meet those, we turn you down. It's, I don't, we're just having to do the best we can now like we did tonight. Uh, and, and it's unfair to ask, uh, well, to ask the developer to uh, provide, I'm not trying to get anybody started, I'm just trying to tell reality. You cannot, you cannot try to extract something from a developer based on a suggested resolution, we've got to have some stronger verbiage and requirement. And that's where the issue is and how it's going to be paid for. But anyway, I, I just want to throw that in because it, it's, it ain't an easy solution these people over here are probably as uh, as adept at finding things, and we have already seen in in the May uh, meeting. You know that was really the kind of what we came up with on the co when the coalition discussed it. You know that we really couldn't. We would like to have all these other. Um, um, provisions and uh, standards and programs and everything, but it takes so much research to get them that we thought, well, we could just take this tiny little step, which is what you have to do at the beginning of designing any kind of program, is to clarify your values. Yeah, and, and the mayor has already said, uh, like in one area of the city, he does not agree with segregating people like, and we have some property up oh, near the ballpark or whatever, uh, how do you integrate all of the affordable housing with all the other developments? Uh, that's part of the whole issue. And, and it's going to take a continued conversation from, well, we like to talk about it, but the elected officials, the leaders, and, and I really do appreciate what, what you've been doing with this coalition, it's, it is a societal thing that needs to be addressed. There are really a whole lot of, commu of communities that do have developers who somehow manage to afford to contribute to, to affordable housing. And, and all, uh, so I know I'm going out of line, and I'm sorry, Mr. Chair. <laughs> okay, I'm through. Commissioner Freeman. I'd like to make a motion that we ad adopt, <coughs> recommend, we support this language. or support this recommendation from the Coalition for Affordable Health, uh, Housing Around Transit and the inclusion of this um, along with the omnibus text changes. Second. Okay, it's been motion and second that the Durham City County Planning Commission go on record as supporting the <coughs> affordable housing, uh, and this is not a resolution, but language. 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 Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay, if there are no more discussion, okay, it's Commissioner, I mean, I'm sorry, <laughs> Pat. If I might, I'll be, I'll be very brief, but just, um, I certainly don't want to unduly influence your, your decision here. We, we fully respect whatever you decide to do here. I wanted to take one more shot at trying to explain where we are as staff and why we don't feel like we can just take this language wholesale and put it in the omnibus um, changes. Um, I think Commissioner Miller's, con I don't want to put words in your mouth, he can speak for himself, but a Commissioner Miller's comments seem to allude to this. The comprehensive plan is, is a plan for overall um, objectives for the community over time. It looks at both land use regulation, which is what you all primarily deal with, but also uh, incentives, partnerships, programs that the city runs or the county runs. Um, the comprehensive plan is a much broader um, palette that looks at um, the broad array of ways that we can influence the, the goal that we all share, which is the affordable housing mm -hmm. diversity, so can, socioeconomic e equality, and the other items in this, um, in this uh, 
recommended language. The Unified Development Ordinance, I think as you all are well aware, is a land use regulatory tool. It only, it only pertains to what we can legally compel folks to do as a condition of land development. And as we've talked about in many contexts in the past, in North, under North Carolina law, those are very, very limited, particularly in regards to the outcomes that are expressed here. Um, ethnic, gender orientation, socioeconomic diversity, and man mandatory affordable housing. So w there are a thicket of legal and practical issues that need to be sorted through f further before we feel like it would be best practice or, or even really ethical for us to include this in an intent statement when we're, when we're not confident there are any legal and effective implementation means uh, that would go in the UDO. So I just, I just want to fully characterize our position. We f I want to unequivocally say we fully support the outcomes here. I think what we, we would recommend that we do is take a harder look at, at how we effectively promote those. So. Yes. And, and I share your concerns, Pat, a lot. Uh, what I was hoping, the reason I support uh, Commissioner Member Freeman's motion is by if using this language from the uh, coalition as a starting place and putting it in the omnibus text amendment. Uh, we fulfill the notice requirements. We may massage the language to make it safer. But I, the, the bottom line is, is we're changing intent statements, which are precatory in nature. You can't enforce an intent statement. Uh, it's not really a regulation. Uh, but it does, it's, it is a little step. It does get over the I uh, believe you used the word earlier this evening, the, the quibbling business about of moving goals to policies uh, inch by inch. We have 60 days, we get this in the notice, we can massage this language and make it safer and better. Uh, but I think it's, uh, because it's in the intent statement, it may be primarily symbolic, but symbols are important and I support the resolution and urge all my fellow commission members to support it as well. Okay, uh, all those in favor of this motion, please indicate by raising the right hand. I think I see Mr. Kinchin's hand. Okay, <laughs> and from where I'm sitting, I can't quite see if Mr. Gibbs' hand is up. His hand not. is not up. Okay. Okay. Okay, all those in opposition? Raise your right hand. Okay. So the motion passed with one. 11 to one. 11 to one. Uh, the 2016 <laughs> schedule is a copy of it at your desk. And I'm assuming we don't have to take any action on this. This is just. Do we have to take action on this? Yeah, we would ask that you uh, adopt this. Uh, I'll go ahead and tell you, unlike this year, there were no, we were fortunate for 2016, there are no conflicts or unusual dates vis-a-vis um, -vis holidays. These are all the second Tuesdays of the month, and they don't appear to conflict in any way with anything that we were aware of in terms of other city or county business. Mr. Chairman, I move that the Planning Commission adopt the schedule as proposed. Second. Second. Motion is second that we adopt the schedule that's proposed for 2016. All those in favor, let it be known by raising the right hand. All those in opposition? Twelve. Uh, do we have, well, I have one announcement. Uh, Commissioner Hollandworth is leaving the area, and November will be his last meeting with us. So. Yeah, we will. We will have a resolution, right? Yeah. Okay, so we will. Uh, any other announcements, Grace? Yes. What's coming up? Yes, uh, Grace Smith with the Planning Department. So next month, um, it looks like you're going to have a couple of information items. Um, Mr. Whiteman will talk about those in just a minute. We're going to have the compact neighborhood update. Grace, could you speak into I'm mind? sorry, the compact neighborhood update. I apologize for that. Um, the omnibus UDO text amendments will be coming back to you, and the preservation plans and consolidated historic criteria will be coming to you as well. There's only one zoning case that appears to be ready for next month, and that's the Rose Walk 
rezoning. That's what? Rose Walk. No, which one is that? It's uh, up on East Club um, in Gregson. Right. Um, I don't have the case number, but it's just a development plan, no plan amendment. Hmm. Okay. It's residential. So. Mr. Chairman, may I ask a question, too, about the progress of some of the things that citizens are asking us about? <laughs> okay. So we're getting some emails and communications, at least some of us are, uh, on rezonings proposed for Guest Road and also for North Roxboro and even on this uh, ROMF, I'm not sure how to pronounce that, but making it sound like I'm clearing my throat. Um, uh, can you tell us if any of those are actually in the pipeline cases filed or files sure. to be read? So the Roxboro Road Retail, which is the one on North Roxboro that's been getting a lot of attention, is, is not ready right now, but could potentially be ready for December, maybe. I, I'd have to let you know next but month. But it has been filed. It, oh, it's that particular case has been in. It was um, tied up in a review of a TIA, and that's why you haven't seen it yet. All right, but it's good. been in the and been in-house. That's the Roxboro Road Retail. And then the other one that you're referring to. Yes, I mean, Road. Right, that has not been received yet today. And what about the ROM? OMF. That, that's not come in as either, either. Mm -mm. And the storage facility down on uh, 751? That is in and ver fairly new. It's under review. All right, thank mm -hmm. you. You're welcome. Mr. Whiteman wanted to speak to you for a moment regarding the cases or items for, for long range planning for next month. Hey, so, as a uh, extended uh, explanation of what's coming to you next month, as Grace mentioned, you'll be seeing a project called the Local Historic Review Criteria Consolidation. Um, probably most of you are familiar with it. I know Commissioner Miller is, maybe a few of others of you are. This is something that we've been working on for several years. Uh, the reason why I wanted to warn you about it is because it's one project, but it's actually going to be seven items on your agenda. It involves the consolidated criteria themselves, plus amendments to all the adopted preservation plans for all our historic districts. It will be overwhelming when you see that see it, but uh, I want to make sure that you know that the the first item is really the thing that's changing. The uh, amendments are just kind of technical things we need to do in order to remove the old criteria in order to put the consolidate the criteria into one document. So if you're going to if you're going to read one of them, read the first one. Mr. Chairman, one other question, Susan, what what is your preferred email comments deadline? Friday by 10. Any other announcements, concerns, Commissioner Gibbs? I, I have just one question for Mr. Judge, uh, and this has to do uh, in a obtuse sort of way, I guess, about what may or may not be happening on the guest road. I have been approached by some people on, some business owners, at the intersection of uh, 15501 and Infinity and Ladder Road, there's going to be some, uh, to me, pretty disruptive <coughs> modifications done there at the intersections. And my question is, have you heard anything from DOT about any possible expansion widening of ladder road uh is there or do they just are they just mum about this sort of thing yes um the intersection of um 15501 north roxboro ladder infinity that's particularly in the north zone that's one of the most highly congested intersections we really have in in durham we don't have a lot in northern durham but that's definitely the exception so there, the city did request and is partially funding, but it's a state NCDOT TIP project. They had a public information meeting um, back in the summer. I think it's been about two or three months where they first uh, proposed the project, got some feedback. Uh, the state's now reviewing it and doing, going in and doing the design work, and I suspect there would likely be at least one more public meeting. Um, once they finish it and um, have the actual designs before that would move forward. But it is a funded NCDOT TIP project, and the improvements are primarily improvements to LATA and Infinity to mm -hmm. provide additional turn lanes on the side streets for dual left turn lanes and, and other types of things to improve the capacity of the intersection. But LATA Road's not an NCDOT 
Oh. It's just the intersection. It's just the intersection. <coughs> the, uh, yeah. It's not a state board. And Commissioner um, Gibbs, I am not those, certain. I those maps that, are I'm not on certain, the DOT's website. I think it may be state maintained. I'm not certain. of improvements. Yeah. Yeah. I, I have a copy, yeah. or I have sent a copy of what they're planning to do. My question was, is there, have you heard anything from DOT about any expansion, uh, widening, excuse me, of Ladder Road from Roxborough to Guess? Not as a That's full widening for that entire segment, just the intersection, just at the intersection there of Roxborough for those additional turn lanes. Okay, uh, yeah. that answers my question. Yeah. Thank you, sir. <laughs> All right, if not, then we stand adjourned. Thank you. Thank you.